Thank you all for, for joining us to talk about withdrawal strategies in early retirement. I um, plan on not on monopolizing this conversation, not at all. Uh, I'm going to open it up for questions very, very quickly. Kelly has the microphone. And, uh, and so if you have a question that you want to ask, just let us know, hands, two hands, whatever you want to do, and she'll get you the mic, and we can, we can make this very participatory. But before I do that, I want to introduce this amazing panel that you are all here to see. Jonathan Mendoza, to my right. I don't always know my right from my left, but I'm, I'm working on that. He started Choose, Choose FI in 2017 with his co-host Brad Barrett. In one year, they had two million downloads and their community launched 130 and counting chapters across the country. Um, he is the only member of this panel who is not retiring in the immediate future or retired yet. Tanya Hester writes the financial independence blog, Our Next Life. She co-hosts the podcast, The Fairer Sense, and she's got a book coming out next year from Pachette. She is early retired in Lake Tahoe, California, which is where we should all be early retired, by the way. <laughs> Karsten Jeske, who many of you know as Big Earn, is the no longer anonymous blogger behind Early Retirement Now. He's 44 years old and he is retired, using his time to travel and see the world with his wife and his daughter. And Leif Dalin, the position on fire, which happens to be the name of his blog, achieved financial independence within a decade of completing his residency in anesthesiology. He is about a year away from leaving his job. All right, before we get to the technicalities of withdrawal and 4% or 3.5% or however we're going to debate this, let's talk about what early retirement means in actuality. And Jonathan, let me start with you. I mean, I think this is really the only value I can add to this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Everything I know about withdrawal strategies I learned from the people at this panel, and it, it's truly remarkable, and you need somebody to go down into the weeds, into the details, and dig this out. It's incredibly important information, and to be honest with you, it's more difficult. It's more difficult than what I've done up to this point. But I think it is incredibly important to talk about reframing or redefining the word retirement. Um, you cannot apply what people think of as a traditional retirement for someone 65 years and older to someone that is has pulled this off in their 30s, has pulled this off in their late 20s, which I know individuals that have done that, have pulled this off in their early 40s. It is just a radically different frame. And in my mind, I think we just need to be a very, because I know people that have walked away from work with 900,000, 700,000, 2.4 million, you know, just an incredible sum of money but you, some people could argue, well, that's not enough. It's not going to make it. You have 60 years. And I promise you, they're not worried about it. They're not worried about it because their worst case scenario is someone else's every day. They can just go back to work. And because they've done this on the backbones of frugality and financial independence, they inevitably have flexibility built, built in to the, this entire worldview that they've built. So... I mean, that's kind of, I can, I can well, absolutely through the point of this episode kind of, or through this panel, try to highlight some examples of what this actually looks like, but that's my operating perspective. I'm like, I'm not concerned about it. And I think that that is, is in and of itself useful. I think that's really interesting because as we saw watching the trailer for the amazing movie that's coming out soon, people do worry. I mean, the, the, the people who are making the movie were clearly worried. Tanya, as you've gone through this, have there been worries? Um, I would not say there have been worries for us thus far, but I think we are really taking a long-term view. So those of you who read my blog, you know that I was like bristling at a little bit of uh, <laughs> what my friend Jonathan said, just because uh, we're talking about really long time horizons with early retirement, potentially being early retired for 50, 60 years. Uh, we don't know that Medicare will still be here for us. Uh, for those of us who are in our 30s or 40s, we don't know that Social Security will still be there in its current form. So there are just so many unknowns that I, I think I tend to advocate for a more cautious approach, but that said, um, 
the funny thing about the word retirement, your original question, is it doesn't even mean what we think of for retirement for a lot of traditional retirees. A huge number of people over 65 are still working. Um, they predict that in the next decade, almost a third of people 65 to 75 will still be working in some way. So the idea of retirement only meaning sitting on a beach and sipping an umbrella drink for anyone is crazy. Uh, that just doesn't apply at all. I think it's more to me really just the freedom to do whatever you want with your time. And if that looks like work, as it does in my case, um, that's fine. And you have what I like to think of as the freedom to fail. So um, I had the incredible privilege this year to write a book that comes out next year. But if it sells zero copies, I'll be okay because I don't need it to do well. And that is really an amazing thing. And so uh, it's, it's to me silly to define retirement based on whether what you're doing with your time looks like work or not. And it's more just about getting to do whatever fires you up every day and having the financial freedom to do that. Carson, is that the definition that you go by? Uh, yeah, so I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm not into umbrella drinks anyway, so at any age. So uh, yeah, I mean, right now I'm, I'm retired. I'm traveling full time with my family and try to, I, I couldn't do this forever. Uh, some people do that for years. Uh, I, I'll try to do that for seven months. Uh, yeah, but eventually I want to, I want to settle down, uh, have a house in the suburbs, uh, send my kid to school, volunteer in school, walk my daughter to school every morning. Uh, so these are all things that, uh, that, this is the opportunity cost if you have the full-time job, and that was always on my mind. I had actually a pretty good job, so I, I never wanted to escape from corporate America. They treated me very well. I, I earned good money, and it was a very fulfilling job. And it was in finance, right? I can't hate finance too much, because that's what I'm doing every day on the blog. Uh, but uh, you see that opportunity cost, and uh, so you see all the other things you can do with your time now. and. Uh, uh, as, as I said here and in other places, it's, it's not a single day that I uh, that I missed my job so far, which is scary, scary to admit that. And I hope I hope nobody back from home hears that. So, <laughs> French TV is here; they okay. may spread the word. <laughs> <laughs> um, Leif, as you think about the next year, and I know you're paying. We we had a conversation ahead of this panel. I know you're paying very, very close attention to the numbers before you actually officially retire. Tell us a little bit about where you are right now. Uh, sure, I discovered financial independence a few years ago now, and and when I read about it and looked at the actual shockingly simple math. <laughs> I realized that uh, that shockingly simple math said that I was financially independent uh, right then and there. So I've taken a few years to uh, let that soak in and, and decide if I'm ready to leave a, a lucrative and somewhat rewarding but also stressful career uh, as an anesthesiologist. Uh, and we're, we're there now. So I'm, I'm finishing out the next year or so. Uh, I actually helped find my replacement, or he found me, through uh, just a very, very uh, Neat coincidence, this uh, young physician is a resident in the uh, training program that I trained in here in Florida, in Gainesville, Florida, and is from the small town in northern Minnesota where I'm currently practicing. So he's going to come take a job that I'm going to create by leaving, and it's going to work out really well. Uh, regarding the numbers, um, yeah, we're, we're, we'd rather overshoot than undershoot because I, I wasn't sure I was ready to leave quite when I discovered that uh, FI number that we had it. And then to answer your question about what is retirement, you know, I, I talk about I'll be retiring from medicine. I don't think I'll call myself a retired person. And when I started my blog two and a half years ago, I said I'm going to post, yeah, probably three, four times a month until I run out of things to say. And now I post four times a week. And so I'm not going to be retired. I'm not going to feel retired. But uh, it will be a more, more fun, less stressful job, no, no doubt about it. So. You refer to it as the shockingly simple math of early retirement. Uh, it's not shockingly <laughs> simple to everybody. No. So take us, just take us through that, and then we're going to dig into the withdrawal numbers, and I'll ask Karsten to start there. But take us through, take us through the shockingly simple math <laughs> that you need to early retire. Sure, and I was going to have Karsten just start right off because he's written the 27 post uh, series on that math. If it's 27 posts, 28 it is not now. shockingly No, simple. no. There are some, some ins and some outs, but uh, if you want to try to make it simple, uh, you, you can very likely see your money last 30 years or more if you have saved up 
25 times your anticipated expenses in retirement. And that includes taxes and anything else, any kind of expenditure. Uh, he'll talk more about the withdrawal rate. So 4% works out to 25 times. Just, you know, 100 divided by 4 is 25. If you want to be especially safe, you might go to 3.5% or 3%, and then you need 28 times or 33 and a third times your anticipated annual spending. So, you know, real quick math, if you are like a fat fire type person, then I'm, I tend to be a little closer to spending more. Let's say you're going to spend $100,000 a year. We're not quite there, but that's an easy number to multiply. Uh, so you want 2.5 million to 3.3 million in retirement assets to cover that uh, level of spending. And that should last 30 years or more, most likely indefinitely, unless you have a particularly bad sequence of returns, poor returns as you approach or enter into retirement. And I think that's probably enough. I guess I should point out there are other ways to cover your expenses besides just having a pile of money that gives you returns via this, you know, stocks and bonds. You can also have passive or semi-passive income from rental properties or uh, other types of assets, angel investing, et cetera, and, and, and approach it from a cash flow standpoint. So your $100,000 a year, you need 8000 and some uh, dollars a month. Well, if you have rental properties that cash flow 9000 a month, you're, you should be good as long as things don't change. And I've talked more than enough. <laughs> Jonathan wants to weigh in, and then we'll get to the uh, withdrawal. And just in light of the fact that we started by talking about the shockingly simple math of this, you know, I'm assuming there's a lot of friendly faces, people that are inside the FI community, but I wanted to point something out that may not have been quite as obvious. You noticed him talking about your expenses. In the FI community, we're obsessed with what are our actual expenses. And this is also to Tanya's point as well, so maybe we can come back to that later. But it's really important to think, even in the calculations you were showing yesterday, it, they were highlighting your income. Well, if you're saving 50% of your income, by, by definition, you're not, you don't need to replace your entire income. You need to replace how much your life costs on an annual basis. It is all about the expenses. And when we see constantly these numbers piped, you need to replace your income, you need to replace your income. You, to do that, to get to that point, if you're applying the same math to your income, you could be working for decades longer than you need to when the simple reality, by knowing the math, it's about your expenses, you could be working a decade, I mean, seriously, five, six, seven years longer for a really marginal benefit. So it usually, it has to start with knowing how much your life always costs. And I think all of us get there, but maybe we're coming from different places. You have to know how much your life costs. Well, and, and that's not always knowable, right? So, and, and I promise we will get to withdrawal in, in just a minute, but healthcare, mm -hmm. long-term care. Yep kids who take six years to get through college rather than four. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, the amount, that, a new roof, right? Mm -hmm. The amount that you're going to spend is not always knowable. And Tanya, you talk about contingencies. So let's, yep. let's, let's get into that. And then we're getting to the percentages, I promise. Yeah, and I'll actually tie this to withdrawal rate because I think uh, it applies. The, the thing that is so important to recognize is a lot of the talk about withdrawal rate to me is a little bit too academic because it assumes that you're going to spend the exact same thing every year. And that's crazy. Um, J.D. Roth has a wonderful post about this where he actually goes through how much he's spent every year and the fluctuation is enormous. Um, and so the idea that you're going to, you know, people like to use the math very commonly of saying, okay, we're going to spend 40000 a year, we're going to save a million, and great. But the number of years when you'll actually spend 40000 if that's your target, is, is probably zero. You know, you look at a blogger like Justin, who writes Root of Good, he tracks his spending. They struggle each year to spend what they have allocated, but his kids are still young. He and his wife are still young and healthy. They haven't gotten to their expensive years yet. So that, to me, is why it's so critical to have contingencies built in and, honestly, to oversave a little bit. I think Karsten and I, and, and Leap, you two, are, are more in the 3.5 kind of range, like a little bit more conservative on withdrawal rates. And what that does is it gives you a little bit of wiggle room for those years that are more expensive. Um, you know, for example, right now, the cost of health care, if you're buying it on the exchange, uh, is going up approximately three times the rate of inflation. And the 4% rule is based on all of your expenses tracking with the consumer price index, which is roughly at inflation, not with things that are much, much higher than that. So 
that to me is a big reason to add a little bit of a cushion, you know, something like adding 10% to your total if you don't have assets. Or like in our case, we have a house that's a little bigger than we need that we own free and clear. We could sell, we could downsize, we could rent, we could live in an RV full time. We have options by having that. Um, but things like that I think are really critical because the, the truth of the matter is the idea of just going back to work, it sounds really good, but when you're most likely to run out of money and need to go back to work is either when the economy is doing really poorly and a lot of people need to go back to work, uh, and you've also now got a big resume gap, or when you're 70, 80 years old, and then how feasible is that? Um, so those are really important reasons to me to build in some safety valves, and what that looks like is going to be totally dependent on your plan, but just thinking that through, so you know, okay, what happens if I turn 75 and all of a sudden we realize that we only have half as much money to spend as we thought? Um, a lot of folks like to say this line that you're going to spend less in retirement, but they forget to ask whether that's actually a chicken or an egg question. Most people spend less in retirement because they have less money than they wish they had, not because it's cheaper to live in retirement inherently. Okay, let's do, let's do numbers and then get your questions ready because we are going to open this up. Right. So, so one of the, the, the key insights that I got from my research was that, I mean, obviously I, I agree Can you with get Mr. a little closer to the mic? I, I agree with Mr. Money Mustache that saving for retirement is simple, it's shockingly simple. So it actually suggests to him he changes his title, the shockingly simple math of saving for retirement, not mm -hmm. retirement, because I noticed that uh, you can't extrapolate the simplicity of accumulating assets to decumulating assets. So what I mean by that, for example, when you start saving and you have zero dollars, you, you shouldn't be too concerned about is, is the stock market expensive or not. Actually, one of the biggest favors I ever got from, uh, from the stock market gods was that I started saving right around the peaks, once in 2000 when I got my first job, and once in 2008 when I got my second job, which was much higher paying than my first job. And you would think, oh, it's a horrible time to start saving, or it's a horrible time to increase your savings, because that was right around the market peak. Well, no, it was not that horrible, because uh, through the market trough, I used do dollar cost averaging. I got, I got really good returns through that. So that sequence of return risk working in my favor. Uh, whereas if you start retirement, you should be a lot more concerned about where you are in the stock market today. We have uh, had nine and a half years, the longest bull market run in history, equities seem a little bit expensive by whatever measure you take. Bonds seem expensive, right? Yields are relatively low, yields are going up, which puts pressure on bond prices. So these are all things that are on my mind, that were on my mind when I was thinking about retirement, they are on my mind uh, when I'm retiring now. So the macro condition, the, the macro, the economics and the financial conditions should be something that have to influence your uh, your withdrawal rate, and not just at the beginning, right? It, this has to be an ongoing process. It, it, setting a withdrawal rate is, is, is more than just setting it once, right? You want, to, you want to follow what's going on in the market and then adjust potentially if we have a, if we have a bear market one year down the road or five years down the road. That, that has to change. So, so a withdrawal rate strategy is more than just setting one single withdrawal rate, set it and forget it and let it go. It has to be something that responds to conditions. Uh, and then on top of that, there have to be also idiosyncratic factors that influence how much I want to withdraw, right? I, am I, am I uh, 28 or am I 44 when I, when I pull the plug, right? Am I, uh, am I married with a younger spouse or an older spouse? Do I have kids that I want to take care of? Uh, do I uh, expect a corporate pension, which is uh, uh, a little bit more underwhelming than, say, a government pension just a few years down the road. So, uh, so I've, I've seen a lot of cases where people, even in today's expensive market valuations, I said, yeah, sure, not, not just 4%, go for 4.5% or 5% because you have uh, very generous pensions that are going to kick in in the future. You have to bridge really only maybe 10 or 20 years uh, with your higher withdrawals, and then you can scale down your withdrawals. So you kind of have a two-phase problem, or sometimes a three-phase problem, depending on when you take your Social Security benefits. So, uh, as, as I said before, uh, on, on the blog and in podcasts, the, it's, it's not just the 4% that's a little bit offensive. The word rule is actually the more offensive part <laughs> than the 4%, because I've seen many people that, well, you should be in the low 3%, and I've seen some people that should be at 6%. 
Uh, so the, it's, it's really only a rule of thumb. And then when you when you consider how much money we're talking about, right, 2.8% versus 6% on a million dollar portfolio is anywhere between 28 and $60,000. That is such a wide range. 4% uh, is not going to do it. It's, it's like saying, well, we should all have a rule of thumb of, have, of wearing size 10 shoes. Right? It's, it's probably a pretty good estimate and a good place to start. No, but I don't call it the, the, the size 10 shoes rule. I, and I don't want to call it the nine size nine shoes either, right? Uh, so it, it has to be something that is, that is individually set and individually determined, both at the starting point and then also ongoing over time. This is not, this is not a one-time set it and forget it kind of thing. This has, to be, this has to be done maybe not every month, maybe not every quarter, but every year you have to sit down, what is my portfolio, where are my expenses, uh, and how did markets perform? Should I make a change? And, and how much of a change do I have to make? Who's got questions? I do. What size shoe do you wear? <laughs> a size 14. So, <laughs> so I'm bigger. 11. Um, we'll go right there, all the way in the back, and then over to you. Wait one sec. Here comes the mic. I was wondering your thoughts on cash cushions and um, also uh, the idea of balancing a larger cash cushion with more in bonds and just your thoughts around all that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I, I like that a lot. I was, I mean, you, you know me because uh, one of, some of my earlier posts were very critical about emergency funds, right? And that, well, how can Big Earn say that a cash cushion is not such a bad idea if he's so critical about emergency funds? Uh, so I like the cash cushion because it's almost like a glide path. You, you uh, hedge a little bit the risk of, uh, of an early equity market drawdown. And uh, so you cushion that uh, that prospect of a, um, of, of a market downturn right around the corner. So it would help you under certain circumstances. It wouldn't help you so much if we had, say, a repeat of the 1970s and 80s, where basically you had a, a 17, 18 year period that was just really underwhelming, then with some really bad equity crashes in between, but they happened so late in the process. Right? You start retirement at age 65, uh, so in, in the year 1965, and the total bottom, the rock bottom, was 1982. You don't have a cash cushion that lasts for 17 years. So uh, in general, I like them. I think it's good for peace of mind. I have it too in, in multiple forms. I have a little bit of a cash cushion right now, and then I still have a little bit of deferred compensation that I get from my job that I just left in June. So if I add that, that that's also counted as a cash cushion in, in my accounting model. Uh, yeah, I, I have that. I like it. Uh, don't go overboard, and you, you will not be able to, to hedge against every single market crash that we, that we could face. How big? Um, so, so right now, I could uh, finance half of our expenses until the year 2021. So. And Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I'll, I'll say we we have at this point actually almost about three and a half years worth of expenses in cash, uh, which is probably a bit more than yeah, yeah most folks. Um, but we, to answer your question about bonds, we count that in the total allocation of things that are not stock. So everything that's cash, then we do not have in bonds. Um, and bond yields are so abysmal right now. And especially if you're trying to do like the tax stuff and you're going with tax-free bonds, you actually overpay then in the, the bad yields for those. So for most people who are retired, um, tax-free bonds are a bad deal, uh, especially if you're not having a super high income. But the thing I would say about cash cushion, for those of you who are curious, is I think that should be the last thing you build up. Um, because to the point, you know, cash, obviously you, you have a huge opportunity risk with you're losing out on stock growth. So do the cash cushion as your very last to-do list item before um, you leave your income, because otherwise you're gonna miss out on. Yeah. And my recollection from a blog post you wrote about the cash cushion was that you actually, over the long run, um, you have less money because of that cash cushion right. because the opportunity cost in those up markets, which are most years, uh, it's more of a, a psychological benefit and, and being able to ride out those down years. But uh, compared to not having a cash cushion over a 20 or 30 year period, you probably end up with more money without one. Mm -hmm. right. So again, so my, my cash cushion, it just came about because I have this deferred compensation. I have no choice, and it, it's exactly the same plan that Tanya has, right? It's a do it the very last thing. Uh, don't build it up over 10 years. So. Mm -hmm. In the back. Hi. Um, uh, kind Tell of a, us who you uh, are. Pardon me? Tell us who you are. 
I'm Roger Walner. I'm a, I, I'm a financial writer, blogger, and uh, financial advisor. And the question I have, and I see, you know, mostly dealing with people that are older than the panelists, how do you account for the continued, well, it's a two-part question. How do you account for inflation in general? And then specifically, you know, the medical inflation. I'm sure you've all seen the study that Fidelity does every year with the increasing costs of uh, uh, retiree medical expenses that they do every year. I think it's 280000 for a couple age 65. How does that factor into your planning? Again, far down the road for, for you folks, but um, age-wise. But how does that come into account? And, th and that doesn't include long-term care. And they, Right, that does not include long-term care, which brings it up over 400000 Gene, maybe? It, yeah, if you take the gap and you use that money to buy insurance. Right, right. Good point. Thank you. One thing I do want to say on long-term care uh, is something that I think is not talked about often enough in early retirement because I think there's a lot of romantic uh, romanticization, is that a word? <laughs> uh, about uh, kind of alternative ways of living, like tiny home living or RV living or permanent travel. Uh, something worth knowing, and of course this could all change, but Medicare has essentially no coverage for long-term care if you have to go into a nursing home. They'll cover short stays in rehab centers after like you break your hip or something like that. Um, however, they have fairly generous coverage as far as anything is generous in Medicare uh, for in-home care. And so it's a really good idea to set yourself up, even if not in your early retirement stage, but at least in your traditional retirement stage in a home where you can age in place. Um, that will do a lot to insulate you against future medical care costs. So just one point. In terms of inflation, I do think it's really important to not just do something like follow the 25 X rule, I, I put it in quotes too, um, but to actually build your own model and build in low expected rates of return. So it was really important to us in building out our numbers that all of this work if we only get 2% real returns long term, which is way, way below um, market averages. You know, over time you tend to make about 6% or 6.8% in the S&P 500 after inflation. Um, that's an annoying sound next door. Um, but we weren't comfortable projecting historical averages because, again, all the unknowns. So I think aiming below averages and making sure that your plan still works is one really good way. I'm sure you guys have things to add. Can you guys speak into the mic? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so th that's exactly a concern that I have, too. And this is exactly the reason why I don't believe that we should uh, have these simple models where you assume that your expenses stay constant over time. And uh, so I. I I would like to have a tool, and I built that tool, where I can uh, uh, add additional cash flow needs at certain ages, right? Uh, and uh, there could be, there could be, I could add the gross uh, increase in medical expenses over time that, that I uh, assume. Of course, some people would say, well, you know, my uh, mandatory expenses for medical will go up over time, but there might also be a little bit of discretionary spending where I spent a little bit less, maybe I spend less on travel, but still the net effect, I bet you, is going to be, is going to be in spending increase. And uh, again, you want to have a way to build this into your calculations. It has to be a customized individual calculation because some people say, look, I have a family history uh, of, uh, of uh, illnesses uh, at old age. Uh, others have not. Uh, so again, this has to be something that is, that is customized. And uh, now the good news is I've, I've done some case studies for, uh, for at least one person that, that brought forward this concern. And it didn't actually make that much of a difference because uh, here's a 44-year-old or 45-year-old who expects to have astronomically higher expenses at age 80. But age 80 is so far away uh, that, so normally people run out of money in early retirement or retirement if you have the bad return shocks right away. So imagine you set a, aside just Fifty thousand or a hundred thousand uh, dollars, and do some mental account. So you set it aside. Well, this is my this is my medical spending increase for the future, and you let that simmer for 35, 40 years. Uh, it's going to be a humongous amount of money, and it might it might help you to to get through that. So so the good news is that I'm concerned about that too. It actually may not make as much of a difference on your uh, on your withdrawal rate. So that's the good news. And I think a lot of us don't really factor in Social Security uh, into our, you know, at least when you're, if you're using a percent. And so for my wife and I, that would be, I think, an extra 47000 a year in today's dollars that I'll have come age 70 if we wait that long. Um, and so that's a big chunk of money. 
and also if you do have a, a bit of a higher spending budget or like in my case I'm planning our retirement based on the expenses as a family of four all right eventually that will be a family of two there will be grandkids we'll still you know buy gifts for our kids and, and probably take them on vacation with us like we do now my kids are at Disney World as we speak or on their way um, so we're, we're basing our our future spending on current spending, which is probably, you know, it's, it's supporting twice as many people as we'll need to do later on. So, you know, you plan for, you know, sort of worst case scenario with, with returns and you, you plan for kind of biggest uh, budget expenditures with the spending and then that creates, again, a lot of wiggle room for increased healthcare expenses uh, and, and again, the social security piece coming in later, uh, which can really help. And then long-term care, uh, it probably, it, right now it doesn't cost more than what we're spending in a year. So, you know, unless both my wife and I end up in nursing homes for 10 years or more, it, it shouldn't really matter. We're self-insured. Um, the, the discussion of 2%, planning on 2% returns makes me wonder if there's any place in the math for an annuity, any situation in which you take a chunk of cash and annuitize, or if that's doesn't, if that's not part of the movement. Do you have an opinion? Otherwise I can go. Go. Um, I think one of the things, I'll try to talk more into the mic, uh, one of the things that I do think is worth thinking about is thinking of your early retirement and your traditional retirement as different things. And that's what we've planned for financially from the beginning. So we sort of saved, we, Mark and I had a, at the benefit of, I should really say Mark, Mark was amazing at saving in his 401k from like age 22. I think he was maxing out by 26 because he's just awesome like that. Whereas at 26, I was still $40,000 in credit card debt. Uh, but it's something where if you can get a head start or you have good traditional retirement tax advantage savings right now, and then you can focus on saving for the near term, the early retirement, um, then you have flexibility. So I think the answer is we're going to look at things like annuities once we get into our 50s um, and consider them at that time. I've talked to several salespeople for them who've told me that they are typically not a very good deal, um, and that there are only specific kinds that really make sense. But I don't think we should all just have a blanket rule of ruling them out. I think it's something to explore, but it's not something that I think people should be purchasing in their 30s, for example. Yeah. Jonathan, did you want to? I do not have thoughts on annuities. So, Ern, did you want, I feel like you want to weigh in. I, I don't have a rule of ruling them out, but it's almost ruling them out, because in <laughs> some way, they are the worst of all worlds. They obviously hedge your expenses and your longevity, but, uh, and by the way, we are here with a lot of uh, uh, representatives from companies that might be offering them. I would like to see an annuity that is inflation adjusted and not just at some fixed rate that's set, say 2%. I want it to be set to the CPI or, or some uh, generally observable uh, inflation index. Because you, you do the math and you say, well, imagine I, I, get a, I get an annuity and it pays me $500 a month. Uh, what is that $500? worth in 40 years, right? If, if we have 1.8% inflation versus 2.2 versus 2.4, uh, you're going to have huge risk of uh, basically inflating away that, uh, that annuity. And uh, again, I mean, especially for early retirees, right, we, we need the long-term power of equities uh, to, to, grow our, to grow our portfolio, to, to sustain uh, expenses over 40, 50, 60 years, whereas annuities, by, by definition, is, is a bond investment. If you look at bond yields right now, uh, they, don't, they don't really look that good. Uh, that said, it could change again, right? In 1997, it was the first time they came out with tips, and some of the tips had real yields of 3% and more. So a 3% real yield, uh, that looks uh, attractive now, and that could probably almost sustain, say, a 3.5% withdrawal rate even over 60 years. If I can guarantee 3.5% real return or 3% real return, I could say that, well, I, part, of my, part of my portfolio, I'm going to put that into some kind of a tips-based uh, uh, account or, or a tips-based annuity that is inflation-adjusted. Uh, it could become more attractive, but again, today's real yields are just so low that uh, you, you, you don't get through 60 years. If you want some kind of annuitization, say you want, uh, you want the certainty of, uh, of a payment uh, to deal with sequence of returns, I would almost suggest you do something like a, 
like a CD ladder over the next 10 years. I, I once suggested it to, to a blogging friend of mine. Uh, they were concerned, well, over the next 10 years, we're going to have a market blow up and we want to uh, have a little bit of our expenses hedged. Says, Should we buy an annuity? And I said, no, I mean, because the, the back end of the annuity, there's so much uncertainty about how inflation works out because it's nominal annuity. Why don't you just do a, a 10 year CD ladder uh, and then hedge a little bit of that, and then you keep your powder dry and you put the rest of the money in, in stocks and let them live for the long run. I think just sort of the big picture to me takeaway from that is that it's just so important to keep paying attention. It, like, as you said, not doing a set it and forget it plan. For those of you who've read Your Money or Your Life by Vicky Robin and Joe Dominguez, the, the first edition of it in the early 90s recommended investing 100% of your money in treasury bonds. Uh, because in the early 90s, that made sense. They were making like 7 8%, and that was a great guaranteed return. I mean, I think we would all take that return guaranteed at any point in history. Um, now, that investment approach makes zero sense because they make less than inflation, so you're guaranteed to lose money when you invest in them. So it's really, I think, just being flexible, but I do think that Carson's argument that an annuity locks up your mon money, it's something that I wouldn't make that decision until much later on and looking at kind of where the what the offerings are. You know, I think one of the things that I actually enjoy about the 4% rule of thumb is, despite its flaws, it actually does account for inflation. Now, you're pointing out that medical expenses and inflation in, med in, in the medical industry, that's far exceeding that, and, yep. and that's fine. What I notice, though, is with the vast majority of individuals, their raises year over year don't keep up with inflation. You got a 1% raise last year. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I just got a pay decrease. Just the fact that the 4% rule of thumb, despite its flaws, actually accounts for inflation in it, just by pursuing this, this path, you're already in a better place. That's like truly remarkable for me. And so what I came with after listening to Earn and hearing him break it down and show all the flaws both now and when we interviewed him on a podcast was, this is a phenomenal starting place. I mean, it actually like, this is, it just, to be able to find a number, even if it's a size 10 shoe, and then say, you know what, I probably need to scale it down. That gives you so much peace of mind because there are so many people that prey on this fact that you need way, way more than you think you need. Um, and so that, that is one thing. The other thing is going back to Tanya's point about separating it out between early retirement and traditional retirement. This is what I think we just need to call the paradox of financial independence. Just the fact that you're pursuing FI at such a relatively young age gives you so much power. And it's unfair how money flows to the people that don't need it. I mean, you see that across the board, but think about what that means for your life when you go to your boss and you realize that they need you more than you need them. Think about what that does. Willie's working, he's location independent right now. He was able to pull it up because they needed him more than he needed. It. it works that way across the board. And so when I talk to people in our community and I get their stories, I look for how they've leveraged that. And inevitably I'm able to get to that point that they were able to get bandwidth. Long before they reached financial independence, they were able to design a job that they were comfortable with. Where maybe their peers are miserable and looking for the exit, but they, they have that ostrich strategy because they don't know exactly what the next step is. These people were able, they're outliers, but they're not outliers when you put them in a group, you realize that there's a common thread, and that common thread is a strong, strong financial ground game. So you started at 4%, Leave you're at 3%, and, and that's where you're comfortable. Can you talk about that, but also we've been dancing around the fact that right now, the markets have been just roaring ahead for so many years that it's frightening. Um, how do we handle the numbers on withdrawal at this particular time in the market cycle? That's, that's a great question. And, and, and again, I have talked about oversaving and working for uh, three or four years beyond the point where we had our baseline financial independence. And that is one of the worries. You know, one of the reasons we have more money than I expected to have at this time is that the markets have performed better than I would have expected them to perform over the last decade. Um, I do want to touch really quickly on annuities. Um, really one of the best uh, annuities you can, you know, quote unquote buy is delaying social security to age 70 if you're in good health and don't need the money at age 62 or 66 or 67. Uh, because you, you get a big, bigger return for the amount of money you're giving up by not taking it at your full retirement age or early. Um, and then also an annuity is really just betting the insurance company that you're going to live longer than their actuaries think you're going to live. Right? So if you are uh, a healthy you know, uh, person at age 70 and your family members have lived well into their 90s or beyond, 
uh, as like a single premium immediate annuity, uh, SPI, might make really good sense. You might actually win that bet because if you live to 99 or you know something like that or beyond, you're, you're going to end up with more money than you would have probably just leaving invested on your own. Um, but I'm sure other people have comments on this frothy market. <laughs> Or, or the thing I just said, maybe. <laughs> no, I actually would like um, Karsten to comment, because you did the analysis, right, that showed that early retirees are more likely to have a bad sequence. Because the, the idea is most people who traditionally retire uh, peg it to age or maybe health status. But it's, it's typically unrelated to market performance or economic cycles. You retire at 65, 63, whatever it is, you get sick, you know. Uh, whereas early retirees tend to peg our retirement date to a number. And because you think about it, everybody's likely to hit that number around the same time we have these clusters. So anyway, I'm, I'm repeating your great work. Right, okay, <laughs> thank you, thank you. So uh, that was an old blog post of mine, and I, I looked at, so if people follow this simple math. A little bit closer. Th so if people follow this simple math, Mr. Money Mustache, you save until you reach a certain uh, multiple of your expenses, uh, then when would they retire? Nobody retires at the market bottom, right? Uh, and uh, so when you, when you look at studies like the Trinity study and they calculate the average failure rates, uh, they would consider all of the different starting points, even the ones that occurred at, at very poor market conditions, when nobody like us would have retired, unless it's, say, it's an involuntary retirement and you lose your job and uh, th that's just when you pull the plug. But more likely, uh, it would be that we would all be clustering right around the market peak. So th that would, uh, again, so don't look too carefully at the Trinity Cluster. study. And the, and the, yeah, exactly. So don't look too carefully at the Trinity study and look at these unconditional probabilities. We have to do the uh, probabilities conditional on A, uh, we had good market performance for the last 10 years, uh, and we might all retire around the market peak. And then even when you look at probabilities, well, you have a 3% failure rate. What makes you think that the 97% that, that uh, would have been a success in the past, that they all had a nice, smooth ride? They didn't, right? There were a lot of cohorts that, uh, when you do the math and you look at the historical simulations, they would have made it over 30, 40, 50 years, but it was one scary hell of a ride along the way. Uh, and uh, uh, so I compare that to, imagine we take an airline and we call it the Trinity Air uh, in honor of the Trinity study, <laughs> and they have a kind of a spotty safety record, and then 3% of the planes crash. What makes you think that the other 97, uh, you, you, imagine you made it, but this might have been a scary, scary plane ride, right, with, uh, with smoke coming out of the, uh, of, the, of the engines and the pilot shouting, we're all going to die. And of course, in the end, we're going to land safely. And the Trinity study says, oh, this was a success. But no, it was, it was not a success. It was scary because you might have started retirement maybe in 1972. And uh, that was actually a good year where the 4% rule would have worked. But 10 years into your retirement, we were in 1982. And everybody thought, uh, we're going to run out of money. Stocks are down. Stocks are dead. Uh, so, so keep that in mind. Uh, if somebody tells you this is the probability of, uh, of succeeding, some of the successes might have been some failures in disguise, too. That's a really, really good point. Roger, I know you have another question, and then I'm going to open it. We'll go, we'll go right to you after, and, and um, if there are a couple more, we can take them, but we're going to run out of the clock. So go ahead. It's, as I said, number three reasons people run out of money, sequence risk, sequence risk, and sequence risk. So it's, uh, this, is, this, is, this is the, so the number one reason. That's coming from that integral part of what you're right. doing, and you factor that in, and that, that goes into the cushion, I think. Right. The mentioned. cash cushion, yeah. Cash cushion, bond glide path. Some people do it through a glide path. They have a little bit higher bond allocation early on, and then they phase that out. Yeah. I'd also argue. Um, that if you are a homeowner or you aspire to be, um, to me, sequence risk is also an argument in favor of paying off your mortgage yes. before you retire. Yes. Uh, because it allows you then to live very, very cheaply if you need to and to be able to cut your expenses to 
very close to zero. Whereas if you are being forced to make a mortgage payment, you may be having to sell shares at a loss when you don't wish to. Uh, so that's another way that you can build that in. And I'd like to just like follow up on that just because it's, it's such a softball <laughs> that <laughs> discretionary spending is a massive part of this. Talking about separating your expenses into structural expenses and discretionary spending. My structural expenses are 20K a year. My actual spending could far, far exceed that. But what does that mean for my personal risk if I know how much it costs to keep the lights on in a bad year? And I can scale down by a factor of three. I mean, that, that's incredible. If a factor of four, a factor of five, what is it? And Ern, I'd love to, because I know you've done this as well. Like, how does that weigh in into your math in terms of that person's withdrawal rate? Well, right. Uh, so, so again, it goes back to the... Uh to the flexibility discussion. Uh, again, I mean, I, I want to be flexible too, right? I, I, nobody wants to admit they're inflexible, right? I go to a job interview and say, hey, I'm totally inflexible. <laughs> and uh, so it's not gonna fly well. There might be some jobs where, where that's, that's asked for, but, uh, uh, but anyways. Uh, so I'm flexible too, and um, I, I definitely bake that in. So it goes back to the discussion. You, you want to uh, look at your withdrawal rate, not, not as a once in a lifetime set in and forget it kind of deal, but you want to uh, look at what happens to market conditions and you want to have some cushion built in. And, but, so the one warning that, uh, that I uh, want to issue is that uh, people think that, well, I have to be flexible only for as long as the market is down. And uh, unfortunately, that's not true. You might have to, so I did some simulations. Well, let me be flexible and let me look at what happened to the 1965 or 1966 cohort or the 1929 cohort. Uh, they had to be flexible for a lot more than the few years that the market was down, right? So the 1965 cohort had to be flexible, all the, not just until 1982, but until the market had recovered enough uh, from the 1982 bottom. So we're talking about 20 plus years you have to cut down your expenses. And yeah, I mean, we could all do that. But again, th this is not like, you know, I, uh, for a year or two, I'm not going to go to Starbucks. So this is, uh, there could be some serious uh, spending cuts. And especially for people in the FI community, we've already maxed out all the, we've, you've already cut out all the, all the fat in your spending. Uh, and then you retire and you set your withdrawal rate too high and then you have to reduce it from there. I mean, a lot of us, we are probably, we have a h budget higher than Mr. Money Mustache. And well, my, my option is, well, if it doesn't work out, then I can cut down to Mr. Money Mustache and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll still be as happy as Mr. Money Mustache, which is not so bad. <laughs> Absolutely. So. I want to I wanna take this question right here. You, yes. I was curious, um, Leif touched on it a little bit. Um, but how you factor in changes in your family situation. So uh, kids moving out, going from a family pl health plan to a single health plan, is that a factor that you take into consideration or is this um, just worst case scenarios? Yeah, I guess my answer is, same answer I've given a few times, <laughs> having, having the cushion, you know, having extra. Um, most of the ones that you described and the ones that we would anticipate will be uh, changes that will benefit our budget, um, but there can obviously be changes that uh, are, go the opposite way. You know, for example, my kids are uh, almost eight and now 10, and so in five years, they'll start to learn to drive, and then they'll go on our car insurance, and maybe they'll crash a car, you know what I mean? So <laughs> there are going to be uh, additional expenses later on. Uh, one thing I've looked at is we talk about financial independence as being maybe you know 25 or 30 times your annual spending, and I broke that down like Jonathan was talking about into my like core expenses of about and for us it's about 40,000 a year uh, versus discretionary you know fun money for Disney World and everything else of maybe 30,000 a year, and I call that financial independence where we have our multiple of 70,000 a year. Um, but I also looked at financial freedom, which we use interchangeably, but freedom to me means you're more free to do whatever. And, um, and, and, so, and so I looked at that and I said, well, what if we doubled our discretionary expenses and instead of 30,000 in, in discretionary fund money, we have 60,000 and then we use the 100,000, 40 plus 30 plus 30 as like the financial freedom number. Um, and we're, we're kind of approaching being there now. So whether discretionary expenses are more travel or you know, more restaurants or you know, more you know, nicer cars. Um, it might be something more necessary that your children or your parents uh, or uh, anyone else needs. I'll add too, I think the, the family change that I think a lot of folks tend to talk about in the FIRE discussion is 
uh, children, of course. I think a lot of people, when you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, that's what's right in front of you. But the family situation changes that I, I think everyone also needs to think through is the potential for divorce and the potential for needing to provide care for sick relatives, uh, because those are very real things that maybe just aren't top of mind in your 30s. But uh, we talk about all these tiny percentages, you know, less than 1% of the population retires before age 55, but a third of marriages end in divorce among millennials. And this is the least divorcing generation of all time. So it's not a, a rare unicorn black swan event. This is something that's potentially very common. So I do think it's worth running your numbers and making sure before you give up income, if you are in a partnership, that you know what would happen. And also I call it a pre-fire agreement, sort of like a prenup, but that you've actually talked through, okay, what happens if we have to divide our assets and would we still both be okay or would this cause some major hardship? But talk about that. And then also look at other options for providing care for relatives. So for example, I have a um, disabled relative and we knew that, oh, you're fine, that we could be helpful. And so we, we found actually a creative way to build that into our plan by buying a rental property that we hadn't planned to buy. Um, but we, we talked with that relative and we said, okay, how can we try to make this mutually beneficial? So it was a big outlay of cash that we hadn't planned to spend. But in the long run, it'll be a good investment um, and it'll help that person um, live sustainably. So it works out in both ways there. So there are ways you can do that that aren't just about forking over a ton of cash. One thing I will say though, because real estate does tend to be talked about as a great option, if you are working a high income job and you get a rental property, 100% of that money is taxed at your marginal rate. So make sure you're factoring in income tax uh, when you're actually looking at rental. Fabulous. And we are going to leave it there because I know that you all have <laughs> next sessions to get to. Jonathan, Tanya, Karsten, Lee, thank you so much. You guys are Thank you, Jean. Thank you.